And we're live. This is Daniel Burnett with trainlikearanger.com. Today I have fellow Army vet with me, Chris. Chris was an infantryman, and uh, he ended up working for the VSO with the college. And uh, I'll let you take over, Chris, and explain what that is. Sure. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks for having me on. Um, yeah, so my name is Chris, um, and when I separated from the military in January 2013, uh, I... I utilized um, what our college had, which was a VSO, which was a veteran services or service, I forget, organization. Um, and it's essentially a liaison. Um, and ultimately, the way I describe it is it's, a, it's, a, it's the best way to onboard successfully onto college uh, because without that, you, you will um, miss some stuff. You, you will leave out some benefits, perhaps, or you might misalign your, your timeline. Um, and so I ended up working there. Not only did I utilize it, uh, they actually asked me if I'd be interested in working there because they had some guys graduating, uh, and I, I, I needed the money, so I, I, I hopped on board. Yeah, and, and me and you were, have talked before, and we talked about how essential that extra money is because, you know, I thought, and I talked about this in an earlier podcast, but I thought, you know, 1700 for a month for the GI Bill, I was like, oh, man, I'll, I'll have Gucci money. And you realize in, in the civilian world, it's not like the military where, you know, especially if you're lower enlisted, your your housing is covered, you're in the barracks. Um, even if you live off post, I mean, your housing's covered. They give you extra money for that. So really, you don't worry about bills like you do out here. Um, and I talked about how little $1,700 actually is. It's actually not that much money out here. Um, and and that's kind of terrifying. Like, I don't, I don't know how a lot of people and make a living, you know, like, uh, yeah, no, and I agree. What's interesting, um, you know, the, the, it's called BAH, right? So if you are, um, a sergeant or above in the army, um, or maybe in the entire, all the branches, but certainly in the army, because in my experience, you have what we call basic allowance for housing BAH. Well, the, the GI bill gives you BAH as well. It's not a separate term or identifier. It's BAH. And it's actually dependent on your zip, local zip code or county. Um, I, I, I went back home to Los Angeles County, specifically Long Beach, California, and cost of living is there a little bit, it's a little bit more. Um, and so it was 2400 I believe. Um, but you're right. I mean, it's basic allowance for housing, not on top of basic pay. It is your pay. Whereas in, in the Army, BAH was on top of your pay to, uh, for your housing off post or for your family to kind of live off in addition to your pay. So that I certainly agree. That's why when when they offered that job, uh, I certainly jumped on board because um, you know I was hurting at the time. Yeah, and I was hurting as well. And I I talked about that in a previous podcast. Like, um, actually, I had a thank God I had savings when I got out. <clears throat> For you guys who plan on transitioning, I really encourage you to have some cushion there because uh, you might need it. <laughs> and and we'll talk more about how the transition process works, but. Um, you know, I definitely, I definitely spared no, uh, no precautions. I got on unemployment almost immediately, and uh, having that cushion as well that that really saved me because, as me and you talked about, Chris, even even though the GI Bill pays while you're in school, they do not pay for any time period while you're out of school. So you need something to cover that those low spots, and it's not even enough for that stipend's not even enough to make a living if if uh, you have other bills and things to worry about. Yeah, that's exactly right. Those low spots, right? Those periods in between when you're not technically in college. And what I mean by that is you're still a student accounted for at your college, but you're not in school 24 seven or 12, to 12 months out of the year. You have periods in between semesters, quarters or, whatever, or what have you. So what are you gonna do about that? And, and, and employment in any kind of way is critical as well as unemployment. Um, and I will say one other thing about the VSO and how it's so, why it's so important. Once I already onboarded, um, it, I realized quickly that it was a not just your typical place for administrative services. It was a place where you go and kind of hang out with other veterans that are going to school with you, and they have study environments. They have couches. They have vending machines. They have a refrigerator for you to kind of put your lunch in there if you want, because you're going to probably be on campus 
the majority of your day, depending on the way you, um, the way you're kind of setting up your, your day to day stuff. And so that was also, that's also one of the benefits. I ended up making some friends that were former infantry types. Um, and we became a close knit community there just because we all were like-minded. We all studied together as best as we could. Um, and we're definitely utilizing the services. And so I always kind of, whenever I talk to other people and they're getting out, I always highlight go to your VSO. It's going to be much more than just your administrative services as well. It's kind of a lifesaver. I I don't know where I would have kind of gone to for even mentorship in terms of academics or even just friendship, if you will, uh, while while you're in college, because we'll talk about this. It's definitely, uh, you're kind of on your own and we'll, we'll definitely talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. And we did, we talked about that a lot before in our previous phone call and, and we had so many good points. And one of the things that you said that I thought was just a genius way of putting it is, you know, there's more to consider than just financial stress. And, you know, as, as a lot of people know, vets have a hard time transitioning in the military world, uh, emotionally as well, because, you know, whenever you go into the military, they train you to go from being an individual to being a group and you get a really good sense of group, how you put it, you get a really good sense of group and, and, uh, you, you kind of forget how to be an individual and that's the problem with transitioning back out is you have to relearn to be an individual because out here there's no sense of group and I hear a lot of vets talk about you know people not knowing their place and and uh, look that's true but these these guys out here they don't have to have a place and and that's a hard pill to swallow for a lot of us vets because you know uh, we're used to all this structure and people doing what they're supposed to do but out here it's all just a big uh solo fest a lot of the time Uh, that's exactly right yep and and so that's a big uh that's a big factor to uh overcome so you know there's a lot more to consider than just just being financially secure, but also adjusting to college. Like for me, uh, the day to day in college, like it was all business for me. So, um, yeah, it is hard to make friends and having something like the VSO, like you said, is a good place to find community because out here, you know, while you're in, you talk about this, uh, branch rivalry, like, Oh, you know, we don't like this branch. We don't like this branch. Whenever you get out, you are just thriving. Anytime you meet somebody else with a like mind, like I, you know, we talked about this. I could take my worst private. I could take my absolute worst private. And if he showed up to work for me, I would jump for joy, dude. I would jump for joy because I know he would do some factor of what he's supposed to do. You know, like out here, you can't rely on people. You know, you either got people who are super, super squared away or you got people who just don't care and they act like any tasks that they have to do that they're getting paid for is a chore. And I tell, I told you about, you know, my, whenever I was working for the college as a trainer, uh, they made me what's known as a master trainer. I would train these incoming personal trainers who wanted to, you know, be hired on. And one of the things that happened was everybody was supposed to get in this group conference call. There's like 12 hirees and, uh, and they were supposed to get in this conference call and I was supposed to lead them through an hour session where I talked about how to, you know, take in clients, client intake forms and, and assessments and things. And I was going to put out a bunch of good info and nobody showed up and only two people gave notice that they had something going on. And they're probably, most of them are probably going to get hired. You know what I would have done? I would have fucking rejected all of them. But that's so common out here, especially in the college populace. It's hard to get anybody who just does something reliable. And so, yeah, I would take the worst, the worst people that I remembered, the people who I thought were the dumbest and worst from the from the military. I would jump for joy if they came to work for me. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, I again, like you said, there are, there are some of our peers in the military that we, we we certainly judged, unfortunately, and we questioned their purpose and their intent around us. Uh, I can give a really good example. Even in the infantry, um, uh, we started seeing a shift in the... I mean, I guess every generation has seen a shift in the way privates come in and their mindset, right? We're certainly a lot different than Vietnam. And Vietnam is a lot different, certainly, than World War II or Korea, 
but we had this NCO, I won't say his name, uh, he started asking privates right away, what would you do if you saw an enemy uh, about to engage me and you had an opportunity to put a bullet in his face? And some of them would say, uh, I would, I'm not sure what I would do. That was, that's alarming. Even right. ultimately, we, we <clears throat> figure out what to do with them or we, or we quickly adjust them and they, they, they realize and they tap into what they're really here to do. It's just for some reason, even in basic, it didn't really click for them. Some of those guys... I would I would reach out to when I was in college and catch up on you know catch up with them and, and and almost rebuild our bond in another way just because I needed even to hear from them and, and get that sense of oh that's right I remember you were one of my peers and one of my good well not necessarily a good buddy but but someone that I depended on and I could count on and I saw it happen uh, whereas in on the, uh, the kind of majority of the people you're around in college have never served in the military. And are coming straight out of high school, and and really undependable. Not to say that they're responsible for the outcome of your test and your studying and all that, but if you're in a group project, which you and I talked about, good luck getting them to do anything for you. Oh yeah. Or above the expectation. It, um, whereas you can you can get privates to ultimately buy in. I, I can't tell you how many times professors would make me the project leader uh, for a, for a group project. And it, I told I tell them every time, look, this product that we're going to deliver is not going to be what I would actually like to deliver, because I couldn't get them to buy in, and they ultimately just submitted their portion the day before this project is due. That's yes. a no go for me, or no go in the military. But that's just the reality. And so, what are you going to do with that? Well, I would vent to my buddies at the BSO who understood and who were experiencing the same things, and it was almost like therapy, right? They would they would kind of pat me in the back and be like, "We're going to get through this, man. Right? Ultimately, we're going to get through this, and we're going to find our way." And, and, We'll just remember this as a shitty memory, and and but just to, just to think about that on a day to day basis, every single day, it's kind of like working with your worst privates that actually never even buy in, and it's it's not cool. Yeah. Yeah, and when I first realized that, I was actually in a biology class. I I asked this kid. He was sitting there. They it was basically these notes that he was taking, and uh, and. I asked him if he could send me over the notes. I had forgot my laptop that day, and I took notes best I could, but basically it's like this PowerPoint, and you fill in the blank. And uh, I said, hey, man, is it cool if I just get that from you? And uh, he's like, yeah, sure, no problem. All, all wanting to help. He had his Internet up at the moment. His PowerPoint was there. And, uh, and I gave him my email. We exchanged numbers. And he's like, I'll take care of this later. And I thought, cool. Well... It didn't happen later. Days went by. I texted him. I was like, hey, man, test is coming up. Like, can I get those notes? I had taken all the other notes. This is like a series of PowerPoints, and this was one I was missing. And the tests were constructed heavily off these PowerPoints. So, you know, I was, I had, I, my mistake was I had let myself trust this guy. And I was like, hey, man, like, can, uh, can I get that from you? And it's something that would have took this kid probably maybe five minutes of his time to hop on his email and send it my way. And, he left me on red, dude. And I, when it got closer to, yeah, he left me on red. And, and when it got closer to test time, I I just got irritated. I called him and he just, man, I can't remember what he said, but I was just on fire. Like I didn't chew him out or anything. Cause I kind of thought, well, this is my fault. You know, that's kind of something that military people do. They take accountability. So I was like, you know, ultimately I can't expect this guy to do this for me, but I remember I called him. I was like, hey, man, are you going to send this? And he's like, look, I'm not at my computer right now. He's kind of giving me a little attitude. And, but when he saw me in person, dude, it was like uh, he was all scattering backwards. Like, oh, sorry, man. I'm sorry, sorry, sorry when we're in fa- person. But, man, when when it was time to help each other out. And, no, and, they, don't, they don't really cover it out whatsoever. N- no. And, uh, it was such a simple task. And, yeah. Yeah. Yep. And so that's when I realized I was like, oh, this is all me. I'm going to have to do this all for myself. And anytime I'm in a group project, there's there's no sense of group out here. So most of the time, there's been rare cases where the group was well. But 90% of the time, I did everything, pretty much. I would have to even go in. It was almost worse when people put in their part because I would have to go in and edit their shit because... They put no effort into it. It's like they were careless. Yeah, you know, when we were talking, right, I, 
we were saying, you know, my wife graduated from college when I was in the military, and so she was watching me go through my undergraduate degree. And not, not too long into a few of my semesters, and I started realizing this, particularly with the group projects. You know, she was the first to say, there's no way you're going to depend on these guys, Chris. Like, you wouldn't have been able to – I mean, my wife's a little bit different. She's – part of the reason I love her is that she's extremely accountable. We're, we really compliment one another. But she, even she admitted 99% of them, even maybe in some cases herself, their priorities are just different. Um, they're going to do it. They're going to do their portion of the work just in time. Whereas in – I can't tell you how many times I would have my work done way ahead of time. Yeah. I mean, way ahead of time. And people laughed at me, including – now, my wife wouldn't laugh at me, but she'd be like, Chris, you know, this is pretty impressive. I don't think she, she'd say, I never worked with anyone in college or studied with anyone in college that would have their papers done way ahead of time or their group projects and kind of following up on them as if they're almost a professor. Right. And um, it was, it, I mean, it, it really is disappointing. It's one thing that I'm going to think about when I'm a father, right, and tell my kid, like, you need to be dependable, you know, and you need to take your studies serious. Now, it, we're just we're also built different our experiences are different and that's also part of the challenge right there are times where i would meet a new veteran in class and they were a little overbearing and you kind of had to kind of tap them on the shoulder and be like hey i recognize you from the vso and um why don't you and i work together instead that might be a better mix let's mix let's let's work with the professor on that because you're gonna you know those those kids over there which they are kids yes um, they are kids you know, you're really scaring them off. And, and if you think they're going to work harder for, it's just almost like being a leader, right? If you think they're going to work harder for you by only being an asshole, um, it's not going to work out, let me tell you from experience. Um, and and, and uh, it, it just goes, you know, long story short, it just goes to show we are we're on our own, we have to adjust, uh, and we have to accept uh, full self-accountability with no one looking over for you or looking out for you, no one, no one kind of checking up on you. And it's, it kind of sounds like we're a broken record. We're kind of like crying about this, but it's just so different from the military where, um, you know, your NCOs or, or even like your platoon sergeant, which is like your platoon platoon daddy, is like the best parent you could ever imagine. Right. right? So you're always walk, wondering, where are these people? There's got to be some sense of leadership around here. There's got to be some person that isn't a veteran that is somewhat like me and cares a little bit like me and, and there are some, but I, I can't. I can't think of uh, any uh, on top of my mind that 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 I came across. I'm sure they're out there, but they weren't there in my, you know, during my process in college. Yeah, in college, it's it's hard. And uh, two things. Uh, I'm glad you said some of the things you said because it's a good segue. But two things is, uh, you know, veterans have to realize that the forceful ways, especially if you were a leader, like. Uh, you know, I used to scream in people's faces and make them do burpees and, you know, haze on some levels I, w- I won't share, but uh, maybe later. But, uh, you know, I, people listen to you because, number one, they kind of had to. And, uh, and you could talk to them in a certain way out here. It doesn't work like that. You can't talk to people the same. The way that you have to lead people out here is by tapping into their emotions and uh, making them like you or, you know, leading by example and stuff like you have to lead by example in the military too. But, you know, yeah, ha- that's purely leading by example and making these people like you on an emotional level. Whereas privates, they don't have to fucking like you, you know? Uh, yeah. They don't have a choice. They don't have a choice. And so, yeah. you know, realizing the difference in leading out here is very important. Um, also people don't have to listen to you if they don't want to. I mean, that's a, that's the shitty fact is, Everybody out here is an individual, and uh, you know my advice is, you know, kind of learning how to be an individual again is is uh, is a big thing, and you know, leading best you can, you know, lead when you can, but uh, it's just different. The dynamics different. Also, we talk about you talked about you know your platoon sergeant being the best leader um, in college. These professors, the dynamic is way different. Like uh, you talked about, we both talked about how. Uh, inconsistent professors are like uh, there's no especially if a professor has tenure there's no real accountability for these people they're not you know I've seen some really great professors and I really really mean that I mean on a personal level there are some professors uh, a handful you know handful out of the vast majority that I've been around but um, there's a handful that 
I'll remember those people because they were very impactful. Um, a couple of them were vets, though. You know, uh, a couple of them were vets. So that's kind of funny. But, you know, there's no real accountability for these people. They will, you know, there's some professors. I had experienced one in particular. I, I really recommend looking into a service like Rate My Professor as a service where you can research your professors and see what other people say about them and they have a rating, kind of like Yelp for professors. I really recommend looking into that. I only took one bad professor and I swore I was never going to do it again. Because this guy basically, I mean, it was an intro to psychology class and I've taken microbiology and all the chemistries and physics and this guy's tests were among the hardest I've ever taken in college. It was just ridiculous. And he covered nothing in his class. He just told, told the same stories. He covered no course material. He expected us to read an absurd amount of out of the textbook. And, uh, and his reviews were terrible. He put them on an Excel sheet. And um, what I did was I just memorized keywords off that review. And I went in, used test-taking skills, and guessed my way to an A. I don't know how I did it. But I guessed my way to an A. And half his class failed. And he went on a rant one day. I couldn't believe it, dude. I almost walked out of the class. This dude was chewing out half his class for failing and took no personal accountability for that. I'm like, well, maybe you're just a shitty leader and a shitty teacher, you know? But yeah. out here, it's different. They, they're they not held accountable for being a bad teacher, you know, at, at least not from what I've seen. It's uh, sometimes they're rewarded for making shit, quote unquote, harder. And we talked about that yeah, as well. That's true. And right, right. That's something that I've learned along the way um, through other personal connections that you know, obviously the more rigorous they make it. And unfortunately, the more that fail, the, um, the better it looks on them. Now, again, they're not really evaluated, nor, nor, and this is one of the interesting things that I learned along the way, is that there isn't a pipeline that includes training for professors. So all that you really need to qualify is educational qualifiers, and in many cases, no field experience. And we both know, especially for those that we're speaking to that are in the military, that are thinking about separating, being a trainer, being a leader is different than how you actually execute your, your own craft, right? Um, that it's essential. To, it, when I was a private, right, I depended on people teaching me effectively. I couldn't imagine my leader saying, you know, here's the deal. You're going to have to go read the Ranger Handbook, and then tomorrow I'm going to expect you to execute it in the field, and then eventually in our during during our deployment i mean we wouldn't win a battle that way and it's a little unfortunate it's not it's very unfortunate that our that you, people are educated in that manner that are eventually kind of filling in filling in our employment spots but it's just the way it is we're not gonna we're not you know the way i told myself was i know these things i'm not here to change it and i'm gonna adapt and figure it out and then one day maybe bring it up which is kind of how i'm doing now but ultimately people including civilians and this is one of the interesting things is I used to sometimes have these moments where it's like, why am I the only one complaining here? And it would kind of put my own, I'd put myself in my own place and kind of realize, look, you just got to deal with it and not, not, not be that complainer. Yeah, you come from a different standard that perhaps should be applied across various sectors and things like that. But it isn't here. It is what it is. And long story short, it's about hold your, you know, get yourself through it, move on, and uh, you know, maybe be a professor one day and, and do it differently. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, and and you know I've heard, I heard my one veteran professor in particular who kind of ragged on other professors in in a low more of a low key way. It wasn't super outright, but he would make comments, and they were super funny because I followed him immediately. I knew exactly what he was trying to say. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, so that's good advice. I mean, you have to just grin and bear it if you want to be successful out here. And uh, you know, influence what you can influence, but sometimes you're just going to have to deal. And uh, I've had plenty of bad professors. I mean, I had to uh, just play their game if I wanted to make the grade. And, you know, it's yeah. unfortunate, but that's the way it is. And there's no, you know, I think that's what drives a lot of vets crazy is there's no accountability. I had I had a buddy, uh, a ranger buddy who was here in college. He was halfway through a semester, his first semester. And, uh, and he goes, uh I can't do this shit, dude. He picked up a contracting job and just flew off for a whole year, dude. Uh, and he's still over there. Again, 
you, one of the common things you'll hear, I when I started working in the VSO, you'd hear, I mean, you not hear, you'd see sto- uh, veterans storming in. I mean, livid, and just I mean, I was telling you about it. Particularly, one of my one of the veterans that I became a good friend with came in and said, "You know what? I'm done here. I won't follow any of these guys, um, professors, uh, into combat." And you know, we had to calm down. Like, well, they're not they're not really going to go to combat. That's no. not probably the right point of view it's not really applicable i know what you mean you know i couldn't trust them with a shovel they might bury themselves without knowing because you know that's how dumb some of them come across right but but you know just just you know go back to your point veterans start to lose their minds even though they're doing something amazing for themselves they're not kind of giving in to well maybe a veteran and and kind of fuck around they're going to college and it's such an it's such an impressive step because it's not easy no. But they will start losing their minds and literally just quit. And I thought about it, right? There were moments where I just thought, I think I'm just going to go back in the military. I think I might have misjudged this. Me too. And, and it yeah. was, it, you know what I mean? And it was really, it wasn't a misjudgment. Uh, maybe some of it because I obviously missed my friends and, and some of the yeah, some of the action for sure. But it was just because I was so desperate for someone to kind of look out for me um, and, and to kind of take me under their wing and to be a mentor. Uh, and, and actually because of this, we started at the VSO, a mentorship program. So when you came in and onboarded, um, you can sign up for someone to kind of be there shoulder to shoulder for, with you throughout your process or until you kind of figure it out. And it was a really big hit. A bunch of, we started communicating with a lot of other VSOs across the country and they started adopting this model and it, it just little things like that. And it goes to show, right? Veterans and those of us in the military are all about teamwork, right? Working together, making uh, building bonds, experiencing things together um, that, that are really challenging. And college is certainly challenging. Uh, and we try to close that gap of feeling isolated and alone by doing that. And it, and it was a big hit. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. Finding that, you know, finding that extracurricular group is very important um, for anybody, but especially for us be- vets who ha- who are used to a sense of group. Like, it's good to have that. Like, so for me, um I felt really lost, but I was fortunate to find a martial arts gym. And, you know, I've been with that ever since because it gave me a sense of community and a sense of group <clears throat> and an outlet. Um, you know, I worry about vets who don't find that, you know, when they get out. We talked about um, how a lot of vets get out and kind of uh, we see it often like they'll kind of let themselves go. They're not on a, uh, like, physical regiment. And so, you know, there's factors to your mental health that's not just you know having a good state of mind if your body's not in a good in good shape your state of mind's also declining as well so you see that a lot they get off that physical training regimen and then um you know probably pick up drinking and you know more not that it ever stops you know i drunk uh, plenty in the military but you know and then losing that sense of group uh, those three things combined is uh can really affect veterans. And then, you know, I talked about before, especially vets who've been through hard stuff like um, combat or some traumas while they were in. For the first time, they're just now getting a chance to digest that because whenever you're in, it's you're always task-oriented. There's always something going on, and people deal with it while they're in. But um, as we know, but when you get out, you really, really it's just you and your thoughts, you know, if you let it. And, you know, those, those four things really affect veteran health, uh, mental health. Yeah, yeah, and I think these, you know, to be honest, you know, we're kind of hitting on some points that I outlined just in preparation to have this conversation with you is, you know, why you're getting out, um, whether that's through the uh, ACAP program, which uh, you and I just, you know, you and I knew the the acronym but never really knew what it meant. It's the Army Career Alumni Program. This is essentially the slotted time you get when you're getting out of the Army to separate, and it's mostly administrative, but they also add in some trans- true transitional career stuff and i don't i would argue it's nowhere near uh enough no, um no. because i've learned I, I i think i could do their job a little bit better but but maybe they're also limited in their time because I, I i think i got about two weeks to separate um and d- during those two weeks i still had to show up for pt formation and, and things like that and i actually had a field exercise that i ended up just uh, managing the comms uh shack while separating so it, it certainly isn't fully de- – you're not fully dedicated uh, to, to separating. But well, what I'm trying to say is this is that time to really start thinking about 
um, what I would consider is a really important component, which is finding a new sense of identity, purpose, and belonging, but with a caveat. The caveat is don't don't let go completely of your military personality or or some some of that stuff that makes you proud about yourself that 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 has almost molded you to who you who you've become. Because one of the things I did that I think was a really big hit for me was I utilized what I got from the military to to allow me to be successful in college. Right. Yeah. Th- those those semesters I did get I didn't get a I didn't graduate with a four point I graduated with, with a three point six overall. But I had a, a, about three or four individual semesters where I got 4.0s. And I, those semesters, along with the others, I utilized my military discipline and almost sort of psyched myself out and thinking, what would my, what would my leadership be telling me to do right now while I'm watching TV knowing that I got a midterm coming up in the next two weeks? They'd be telling me to hit the books. Yeah. Right? So I would quickly get off my ass and go, and, and go study. And those are those things that some of the most successful veterans in college, from what I remember in my experience working so closely with veterans at the BSO, was a game changer. Yeah. Right? It was there was a lot of veterans that would literally pretend to have never really had any association with the military, maybe for good reason, or maybe because they had a bad taste in their mouth. Unfortunately, I had a great military experience, um, but they 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 I mean they probably struggled for a variety of reasons. But I would argue part of it is because you're you're reluctant to utilize your your, your discipline from from the military. So, but anyways, you know, finding your identity, finding a purpose, and finding a belonging, and that can be short term as well as long term. I, you know, for me, my purpose in the, in, in, in the short term was getting from one semester to the other, right? Considering all the the, the challenges we just discussed with lack of uh, peers, uh, professors that are not accountable, right? So my purpose was I'm going to get through the semester because it's an uphill battle. Um, and then I'm going to move on, right? And it was just so I had a, I had a much larger purpose, which was a, a future career, uh, and to graduate with, with with honors from college. But you know, you can't tank, you can't utilize that every day. It, it, one of the things I noticed about college is it, it, it just takes forever as well, right? One, a lot of our schools in the military, like schoolhouses, they're not four years long, right? So before you know, Ranger School is roughly the length of a semester and, and you walk out with a tab on your shoulder. Well, can you imagine going to write your school for four years and that yeah. being your long-term goal? That would be devastating. I mean, nobody would probably graduate except for very few. So you, you certainly want to tailor your, your, your purpose uh, to, to kind of fit the, uh, the short term, I would suggest. Yeah. And <clears throat> that's a good point. I mean, you hit a couple of points I want to piggyback off. So, <clears throat> Uh, yeah, college is, is uh, if you're trying to make the grades, college is actually not easy. It's a different type of hard. You know, when you're in the military, it's it's hard in its own way. Being in college is a much different challenge. But it is, make no mistakes, if you're trying to make the grade, it is hard. For a lot of reasons. Yeah. Financially, really, transitionally, yeah. emotionally. Um, think about Think about what... The way, the, way, the way it works in, uh, let's say you go to like our slick or ranger school, right? The, they pretty much set you up to kind of just focus on that. They'll pay you well, generally speaking, right? They don't change your pay just because you're at a new temporary duty station, right? They, they, you still get your BAH, your family's taking care of back home. Your leadership is supporting you to go to this school. You have great leadership, arguably the best leadership school in the United, United States military being ranger school. And all you're told is now just move forward. Take one step at a time. Go find one point and then the other in your land app or something like that. Uh, get through one phase and then the other. Whereas in college, suddenly you're looking at uh, uh, a financial deficit. You're looking at lack of leadership and all this stuff. On top of that, you're trying to get a 4.0, which I'm going I'm to be honest, every veteran at the VSL that I, that I interacted with wanted a 4.0. That was one of the – the veteran – they had this statistic at our, at our school that said basically the outcome was um, that – the, the, the group of veterans that were represented by the VSO had some of the highest averages of GPAs across the school. And it was be, a lot of it was because they were, were so focused and were so eager to succeed. Uh, but but not, I mean, not, all, not a lot of us were, or it was one of the harder experiences we ever had to encounter because we weren't just doing that on a perfect basis. We were managing a financial deficit and all those other things we mentioned. So it's like you said, it is, it's 
a different kind of hard. You can't muscle your way through it. You can't badass your way through it. You have to suddenly tap into your intellect. Uh, that maybe is your, the first time you've ever done that. It certainly was for me. I, I slacked off in high school, and I don't really feel that I needed to have an overbearing amount of intellect in the infantry. And suddenly I was taking economics classes and uh, foreign, you know, I, I majored in political science, so I took a lot of foreign affairs classes and you had to study certain things that I thought, you know, I just never really experienced and couldn't really crank out a few push ups to get better at it. I had to, you know, kind of level up my intellect and uh, somehow pay bills at the same time. Exactly. It's just different. Yeah, a lot to juggle. And so that brings me to another point that we talked about, Chris, and, and it was. Do we go to college or do we try to choose an immediate career? What are your thoughts on that? I think it's a, it's something that I wish I would have uh, considered um, from the get-go. Um, that be, Only because my college experience was a challenge for me. Um, not necessarily academically. I, I, I generally did well. But when you, a lot of us have families. And when we're talking about that financial deficit, um, it's hard to justify that your 4.0 semester is going to really pay off in the next, let's say you're in your freshman year, in the next three and a half years when you graduate. And it really causes some mental strain or stress. And so what I would kind of wish I would have done is maybe consider being a part-time student and maybe looked at being a police officer uh, along the way and then maybe taking some night classes um, or um, not going to lie, if you're, if you're single, consider traveling you know consider consider uh doing something on your bucket list before you get to college yeah you notice really quick you're gonna feel like dude like i just went from an ex- amazing experience but was also extremely challenging to another challenging experience and meanwhile you're you're with all these other kids that are in high school they're like you know i'm actually going to study abroad and i'm gonna take a year off a leap year or gap year as they call it yeah and, and you're over here hungered down miserable and it, and it made me wonder like what you know I wondered it for a little bit because obviously I was married and, and I couldn't think about it too long, but it didn't make me wonder, you know, did I go about this correctly? Am I overdoing it here just for the sake of success? You know, there might be some, because I saved up my money like you and I could have probably afforded it. Um, so maybe I could have traveled a little bit, but it's something to really think about. It comes down to who you are. It comes down to how much money maybe you saved or, you know, maybe you're looking to become a, if you're looking to be a, looking to be a police officer, you may not even need a degree. You may not even need an associate's degree. And so you can quickly transition into that. You'd be obviously a great candidate. If you're really going to be a firefighter. It's just probably a six to seven month EMT certification process. Yes. Yeah. Try out. Uh, and then if you're looking to be a contractor, this is something to actually, I was just think, talking to my wife about. If I could go back, this is actually what I would do. Being a, you know, a government contractor where you're basically P- PSD, I would actually consider doing six months out of the year being a contractor and then dedicating the remaining six months out of the year to, to, to doing college. Would that extend in my college timeline? You bet, certainly. But again, I found times where I was super adrenaline insufficient. You know, I wasn't, you know, we didn't talk about this, but I was in 11 Bravo, or maybe we did. I was in 11 Bravo, and I deployed Iraq and Afghanistan and thrived and loved combat for what it was. I mean, there was really challenging moments like losing a buddy or so. But for the most part, a lot of us, we were kind of thrill seekers, right? And and we wanted to kind of get get in, get get, in, get in engagements with, with the enemy. When you don't kind of have that anymore, that is its own challenge, and it leads into mental strain. So actually, if I go back, I would I didn't know about it enough at the time, but I would have done the government contract kind of uh, route, and then just told them, look, I'm going to do a hard six months back to back to back, you know, kind of deployments um, with our unit. And then I'm gonna, and then you can kind of count me out for a little bit because I'm gonna go to college. And then at the beginning of the year or whatever, however you're gonna balance it, get back into those deployments. Um, and you, you make over a hundred thousand dollars a year. So you're talking about how many students make a hundred thousand dollars a year while they're in college, right? right? So we, you know that's something I would I would have thought. But again, it really comes down to you. Um, if, if you want to become like like you're like, you know if you want to become a doctor, your school's already long enough as it is for doctors, you may not want to postpone it any longer or make it kind of last longer. So you may want to get started right away. But it's something its something that when I was going through the ACAP process, um, it really wasn't talked about, um, you know, that you have options as a prior service member and, and kind of kind of living the dream where you can balance things out and being a cop or being a firefighter and going to college at night, being a contractor, um, 
even even doing I know someone that is doing border patrol and going going to going to college at night when they can or doing online classes while they can. That's that's great. I wish I would have done something like that and, and I, I wish I would have been informed on it. Right. Yeah, many ways to go about it. And that's, you know, I see that a lot with vets. I mean, dude, if you go straight into a long process like college, and and I'll tell you something about college. And from my perspective, college is this long, monotonous, slow slow road. And you, you're studying a bunch of coursework that doesn't pertain to what you're actually going to do. It's just all busy work. You're having to play whatever games that professor for the semester wants to play. You're stuck with a bunch of kids who um, aren't your age and don't understand your hardships, or, and uh, and really you don't want them to. I mean, most of the time you don't want to interact with them, and uh, it's it's just way different. And then you lose that sense of, uh, like you said, there's no excitement in your life. So I mean, you can get really you can get down if you don't have some sort of outlet. And you know, I can relate to you, Chris. Every time you know I was overseas doing anything real. You know, uh, it doesn't make sense to a lot of people who haven't uh, experienced it, but getting shot at is like the only times I've ever felt alive. And oh, yeah. The best, some of the best times of my life, aside from getting married and, you know, my wife's recently pregnant. But aside from that, I mean, we were, we were pretty happy. It was, you know, you actually get to execute your job. I think that's part of it. Yeah. Yeah. It's just something that's beyond real. And, and, uh, you know, my experiences could have been a lot worse. I was fortunate to um, have the experiences that I did and be on a team that was uh, wildly successful and, and things. So, um, you know, I'm sure it gets it gets. There's some very dark times, but I can speak from my own experience. Uh, only times I've ever felt alive. And then you take that away. You take all that sense of excitement away, and uh, you know, you put you kind of transition. And, and I was grinding because I didn't want to fail. Like I wanted to. It was weird because I wanted to prove something to like the people who uh, I had moved on from, like, like you can be successful out here, you know, because so many times people had said, uh, and I want to cover something too. I will try not to ramble too long, but um, a lot of the times they'll tell you like, you know, if you leave, you're going to be crawling to come back. And there is a little bit of truth to that because when you leave, you're like, shit, I really left. You know, I'd put all that time towards it, uh, you know, all these, all these schools I'd been to, all the deployments and I had built this uh, extensive military career, and me and you both talked about that. But you kind of leave it all behind, and that's uh, that's. It's just a, it can be disappointing. It can be. Kind of when you get into those dark moments. I don't know if they're dark for everyone, but just those moments where you're kind of second guessing yourself. You kind of realize I had a career. Yeah. I was somebody. I had a path. I could have led my own platoon in the next four or five years. Um, you never know. You could have transitioned to the Pentagon, which is kind of a big deal. You never know. Yeah. And you, you literally left that on the table. And you're a sophomore taking a, you know, a intermittent kind of English class because it's a requirement. And your buddies are saying, hey, we're about to head out on deployment. What are you up to? You know, I had a buddy that came from, you know, your, your environment, and Ranger Regiment. And he said, Chris, I was just thinking about you. We were fast roping into this compound. Uh, and I couldn't help but think about you know, how much you would have loved this. And, I, and he was like, but what are you up to, man? And I'm like, I don't want to talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I really don't want to. It's not even comparable. All right. Uh, so it's tough. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It is. That, um, that I, you know, talking about what other options you have is something I just recently came across. And it's something that I'm considering is, and I didn't know anything about this. You know, when you're, you and I were active duty, and so when anybody talked about National Guard, or, or reserves who would literally just frown and kind of poke fun at it as well. But I recently found out that, you know, SF units, Green Berets, have two National Guard groups, 19th and 20th group. If I could have gone back perhaps as well and transitioned to, transitioned to the National Guard and gone down that pipeline through SF, I would have. Because yeah. you, could have, you could have become, I could have, you know, you or anybody else can become a Green Beret and you can come back and say, now I'm going to go to college because the tempo is a little bit different. It's not completely equivalent to active, but you, but from what I've learned is that they have two careers or they have two activities. They have their commitment to the military uh, and to their teams and all that and deployments, but then they also have 50% to their own, to themselves, which is a career or whatever it is that you want to do. Right. Um, so it's something, you know, there's so many options. The other thing is owning a business. Um, 
a lot of us come from extremely fi- um, fitness orientated teams. At least I did. I was in a um, reconnaissance and surveillance team, and fitness was everything. It was the way we proved ourselves, uh, or at least one of them. And I've thought about what if I would have opened up a gym and, right. and had my own business? Um, yeah, it would have kind of sucked because you would have taken a big loan out. But I had something to offer, and maybe I would have gone somewhere. Um, I'm not trying to make it seem like I completely regret college because I, I have a great career. But I go back, you know, whenever people ask me, like, if people have asked me, how have you recovered from your college days? They don't ask me, how have you recovered from your military experience? Because they know, they know that I love it. They ask me, how are you doing these days relative to your college career? And I tell them, a lot better, a lot right. better. And I certainly would have done a lot of things differently, but um, I'm doing a lot better. Thanks for asking. Right. Now, that's a, that's a great point that you made because you still get that. Because let's be honest here, there's a reason that you transition from active duty. There's something about active duty that, you know, you want to go try. Maybe maybe you were 18 and you want to go try other things. But, you know, having something like uh, the Green, Green Berets is like the only special forces that uh, type that special operations that does uh, the guard, which is very I interesting. I and so, never thought that. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a weird, weird thing. But, you know... Um, that's something you can do and then you're kind of like uh you're tuned in but you know you get to try all those other things you wanted to try and you know there's a reason you transition so that's uh very you know national guard is you still got one foot in the door especially if you have IRR time you know uh that's something to really consider you know continuing um you know i didn't i transitioned completely and uh there was another point i wanted to make too so, yeah, I really like that you made that point. National Guard is definitely something to consider. Reserves is definitely something to consider. Because worst case, you still got a foot in the door. And if you decided the civilian life isn't for you, you can always go back. But, uh, you know, for everybody else, if you have IRR time, which is inactive reserves, everybody has an eight-year obligation. So um, if you serve four years, you owe four in the IRR. If you serve two years, you owe six in the IRR, et cetera. You've got an eight-year commitment. So you still got a, kind of a foot in the door. But, you know, I'd really consider those reserves and guard and stuff because you still get to uh, keep up with stuff and continue promoting and things. But, um, it certainly is. Yeah. But something else I wanted to note for, uh, there's a point I wanted to make, so I want to make sure I make it. If you're a leader and you happen to be listening this far, really, uh, really know the importance of your soldiers transitioning out of the military. There's been times where I've seen privates and regiment really get screwed over um, because people don't understand the significance of allowing time for these guys to transition. So like I've seen a private get rejected terminal leave and then freaking uh, one week left in his service time. They're like, okay, go do a cap. They've been making them do all this bullshit in the meantime. One week is not enough time to figure out your life. You, you basically what they've done to, to some of those people is those people get out and they lose all income abruptly. And then a lot of them will go fail because it's no joke in the civilian world. You have financially, it is no joke. If you don't have pe- the right people supporting you, you don't have the right places to go. I mean, where are you going to go? The streets, you know, it's, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of, I really express to leaders because, you know, I heard one E6, he was going through, uh, reg- regiment guy, he was going through ACAP with me, and he's like, man, I've screwed over so many people. He's like, uh, I didn't realize how important this was. I was like, yeah, yeah. you know, uh, it's it's so important, and uh, people need to know what they're doing next. That's no small task. It really is. I think that's a good point when you said they need to know what they're doing next. I'll give you a really interesting statistic or kind of just some data. Um, that we came across the VSO, and I'll never forget it. One of the realities about, well, for the most part, um, you're, when you're in the military, it's 24 7. You're always on call, even if it's on a Saturday or Sunday. Uh, you never know what can pop off around the world, and, and especially with your, you know, with the unit you were in, you guys got to be ready to go in hours. Um, but you could also be called in for stupid reasons, like someone did something stupid on a weekend. You're all got to get called, recalled in. But that makes it so that you're, you're basically on the job 24-7. Right. And to be honest, when you're on the job 24-7, think about this. Five years of doing something for 27 for, for 24-7 is 21 years of corporate service. 
21 years. Yeah. Or if you do 20, 20 years of service, 20 years of service, not five, but 20 years of service, that's 84 years of corporate service. One week or two weeks of transitioning from that is not going to cut it. No. Nope. There's no way you're going to go from being so ingrained in something the way we are in the military to suddenly thinking, I'm going to be ready to go in one week. Maybe you are, some of us are, but the reality is that we're really not, and the majority of us are really not. Yeah. Yeah, I actually, uh, you know, I was a, I was a yes man for most of my career, and, and towards the end, um, I knew, I kind of, just listening to other people and being observant, I was like, I have to take some time to get out. So um, I kind of hit a lot of friction with, uh, with my leadership, you know, uh, transitioning out. Um, and I regret nothing. I think I needed all that time and, uh, still felt like it wasn't enough, you know, uh, it still felt like it wasn't enough. And some of it's just, you're, you're just going to have to fly by the seat of your pants and figure it out. But, um, you know, really emphasize that to the leaders who, uh, cause you're absolutely right on, on all those it's topics. Tough because if you're, if you're lower enlisted, um, if you're really any, if you're anyone, I, I'd argue maybe not officers, they, they kind of have their own club um, and, and sometimes can be a little bit of a double standard. But generally speaking, enlisted, um, and you just don't get enough time and, 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 and you don't really have a lot. Like we were going back, right? You, you, you have to do as, you, as you're told. Uh, for me, as an example, I was within a month of separation and they put me on a detail to man comms shack during um, one of our scout and rec- or, uh, sniper and reconnaissance selection for the new next set of guys coming in. Um, and they, they're like, hey, you, you, you're going to man comms because we can't, uh, you're on your way out. And nothing against me, but they're like, so, but we still need someone to do that. Yeah. And I could tell you a hundred things I needed to do instead of that because it was a week field exercise essentially or selection yep. or a week long uh, uh, selection. And, and I couldn't do anything but just sit there and, and do, you know, because I was an RTO and do my job as, as an RTO uh, in the field at least. Uh, and it was really disappointing. You know, I, had a, I can't lash out. I couldn't speak up about it because of my NCOs. Um, and, you know, some of my, my immediate COs were, felt a little bit bad because you're closer to your, your team leader than your squad to your squad leader. We had a new platoon sergeant, if I remember correctly, and so he didn't really know me that well, and he just thought, look, I, got, I need people to do their jobs. Right. And whether, if, you're still, if you're still in my formation today, you have an obligation today. And there's certainly truth to that. But again, um, they, they've never gone through the process of getting out. They haven't had to really think about it and bear all those concerns. And so they're just like, hey, Chris, you, I need you, man. Come, I need you to come do your job. And so you got to say, Roger that. Yeah. You know? Yeah, you do. And and that's funny because I, I had the same thing happen. Uh, pretty much like a week that wanted me to go be an OC uh, for this, you know, scenario they were running. So... Uh, I was an OC, and that was a weak job as well, and that was in my last month. So it was just kind of like they pulled me. Man, I had more staff duties and uh, and CQs than my entire career in a, in that last month. And I was like, man, this is uh, – y'all are kind of slapping me in the face right now. <laughs> you know, like uh, somebody had to do it, you know, and, and I have no uh, no regrets toward that. Luckily, I had enough time, but I also had rank. So having rank allowed me some time, and trust me, I it was not smooth. I I had friction. Um, I kind of did some things on my own accord. Um, sua sponte, right? Uh, sua sponte, some things. But uh, yeah, yeah. But I had to. I mean, I just yeah. It, it's so important for leaders, you know, especially if you got privates, protect your privates and and give them some time if. if you know, maybe they didn't have the best career or the longest or whatever, and they're transitioning. You know, look out for those guys. They're they're still going to go out there in the civilian world and hopefully make a great impact. But you got to allow them the time to transition and and uh, figure out where they're going so that they can do that. Because trust me, they will be impactful in the civilian world. It's uh, they'll be a dime a dozen. They'll be very influential people. Yeah, they will. It's kind of surprising. You know, we would have never thought so uh, right. while we were in, but even they can be. We all can be, but especially them. Right. But you want, you want to talk about um, some of the, the administrative stuff in college? Yes, absolutely. So one of the things that we talked about, and I'll let you kind of take the wheel after I uh, start with this, but 
uh, I told you a story about a guy who had been using his GI Bill for uh, for a long time, probably a year and a half, and he thought that if he took less classes in a semester, that his GI Bill would would uh, last longer. He didn't even understand how his GI Bill worked. The GI Bill, no matter how many classes that you take, and and this is also another good point for earlier, uh, it's 36 months, no matter how many classes that you take. And so a lot of the, uh, the influence is to take a bigger class load. So it's kind of hard not to do college full force. If you want the full housing stipend, you take full-time classes. Some people take over that. And uh, especially if they want to wrap up their degree in the 36 month time. So you're busy with college. I mean, pretty much college is full time if you're on the GI Bill. Yeah, I mean, I, that's again, exactly. That's where the VSO came into play. I know that that story is a really common story. Um, not, not to mention that another really common story or situation is um, hey, I took. You know, full-time course load is four classes, which is a total of 12 units, given whatever college you're in. But I took a fifth course, or I took a sixth course. Why am I not getting more money? And you don't. There's a max. You're not going to get more money just because you take more classes. This isn't a profiting system. This is an opportunity to transition into a career that requires education, if that's the situation. Now, on, on the other hand, if you take less courses, because maybe you are only taking night classes or online classes, whatever, because you did balance out a temporary career um, that suits you while you're in college. And let's say you take, uh, let's say you have eight units where 12 units would be full-time. Let's say you have eight units for something like that. Um, you're going to get your pay prorated. Those are big shockers to yeah. veterans. Yeah. I mean, again, we're going to, money is by far, money and probably mental health um, are, and, and money leads to the mental health issue. Um, is by far the biggest component that that's veterans are trying to make sure they have locked up. And it's no, it's for good reason. One, I'd say, is because a lot of us save a lot of money, a lot of cash. We don't have a lot of bills. We don't pay for housing. We deploy a lot, and it's just it's kind of like a money maker. And we don't want to lose that. We don't get out of college to use a savings account. We have that as a reserve for emergency purposes or to maybe a, for eventual down payment or something like that on a house. Right. So to see you or to suddenly accept that you're going to use that money, um, that reserve is really disappointing, and it's one of the biggest factors that guys end up, uh, or guys or girls uh, get out of college and, and reconsider um, something else other than college. Yeah, yeah. And, and for people who don't know, units is semester hours. So uh, basically there's a certain amount of hours that you need to hit in a semester to be considered full-time. It's a, You can correct me on this, Chris, if I'm wrong, but it's 12 for a full-length semester, so like the fall and spring, and then yep. it's six during the summer. It really depends on your, you know, so um, I went to a, because I'm in California, the, the, the educational requirements are a little bit different. I knew, I knew veterans that literally walked out, walked away, you know, walked out of the military and walked into a college or a four-year university right away. California doesn't let you do that. You have to get yourself to a four-year university by going to a community or city college. Um, so I had to do that first. Um, and at a city college, for me, it was 12 units that equaled full-time status. When I went to the, when I transferred into the university, it was 16 because the unit number was just a little bit larger, but it's all relative. It's just identify what full-time is and figure out where to go from there. Yeah. Yeah, and, and there is a veterans, uh, a veterans Affairs office in each college, so... If you have any there questions, be. there should be. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Just if you have any questions, you can always reach out to them and ask ask away. Um, I was very fortunate to have good uh, veteran offices in all my colleges, and uh, and very helpful. Ironically, uh, I actually knew one guy's uh, brother in regiment. Talk about small world. Um, he looked familiar, and he saw I was wearing a, a Ranger shirt. And he's like, hey, man. He's like, what battalion were you in? And I was like, first. And he's like, do you know so-and-so? And I was like, yes. And he goes, that's my brother. And I could see the resemblance. It was trippy. So, yeah, just cool experiences for me. But, yeah, definitely um, definitely reach out to those guys. That's what they're there for. That's, you know, what Chris was there for. And uh, we get it because we're going, you know, a lot of those people are going through it too or have been through it already. 
Yeah, and some, some of those guys, um, we didn't really have this. I tried to do that within my employment role. But some, I would imagine that some of these VSOs have former NCOs that find their place and, and sort of become an NCO again right. relative to what they're doing at a VSO. I don't think you can literally hold a morning formation. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. you never know. Some of us would have actually benefited from that. Uh, but um, if you find that, if you see that, good for you because that will make a big difference, um, especially when it comes to having mentorship. But also they're going to make sure that, you know, if you're over here saying, uh, I'm a full-time student, and they go and look at your record because if you in the VSO, you can look at your academic. We, we have access to your academic progress and stuff like that and what you're up to. And they see that you're not actually full-time. You don't. They'll be like, dude, you don't, you don't know what's going on around here, so let me, let me, let me help you out. Um, you may not always have those kind of employees that are um, at a, that work. Not all employees at a VSO also are, are former enlisted uh, or for, for, yeah, former military. Um, the majority where I worked were, but actually – our senior leadership was not. They were oh, they're civilians, and they they always were, and they were basically moving up in, in the ranks within their higher education careers. And, and the VSO is just one of their stops along their career pipeline. Um, and they really looked to us to really fill in a lot of the gaps. Um, but we could only do so much. But so, um, you know, so here's one other thing I like to say about the 36 month long benefits you get under the uh, uh, the, the 9-11 GI Bill, uh, which is what the majority of us are probably utilizing these days. When I first went in the military, uh, which was in 2007, you could choose to either be in the Montgomery, the older school kind of GI Bill, or you can pay into and or transition into the post 9-11 GI Bill. Yes. Luckily, I did that. The fact that they even give you the option is kind of bizarre because I think the Montgomery GI Bill... Um, which is something that I never really worked with that much because so many of the people that we serve at the VSO were people of our generation and post 9-11. But I think it's a little bit less benefit. Yes. Um, and That's... so the fact that they even let people that came in after 9-11 to even tap into a benefit that is less beneficial is concerning. But I think they've actually addressed that at this point, but I don't know. But anyways, so if, 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 you're, if, you're, if you're allotted these 36 months, um, and let's say you're in a state that has pretty rigorous higher education entrance requirements, such as California for me. What had, what I had to do was because I no longer had a high school had valid high school transcripts because they're, they expire after five years, um, and you I didn't take I didn't take SATs because I always knew I could go in the military, so I had to go to the city college route. You have to take an entrance you have to take a few entrance entrance exams, and it determines where you're going to be able to start your placement in terms of what classes you qualify for. Now, just imagine if you did five or whatever, how many years, and suddenly you're trying to take a test in calculus, maybe you still got it, but most of us don't. Yeah. I'm not gonna say most of us, but a lot of us don't. And so I unfortunately, what's like when it came to English and writing, I, could, I, I was able to immediately qualify for good courses that were immediately transferable to the university I would eventually go to. But when it came to math, I didn't score that well. And it's not a surprise. I mean, I just hadn't done any math for almost six years. And so I had to take remedial classes, uh, as embarrassing as it is. And it actually really benefited me because it got my feet wet. And I realized, man, I don't know what I would have done if, if – because the tests don't don't cover everything. It's just a sort of uh, – they get a feeling if you have some potential to kind of keep up in a calculus or trigonometry class. And I, I wouldn't have. And when I took this remedial course, um, it got my feet wet, and I really benefited what I'm trying to say, though, is it's that it, it, those courses counted against my benefits just because they're remedial and just because they're not going to be transferable to your university yeah. um, or perhaps won't account for the, the, the type of courses you need for your degree or your associate's degree, for that matter. Yeah. Um, the, the VA doesn't care. Yeah. Still, it's still education that you're receiving and therefore util, uh, you're utilizing the, the, the GI Bill. Um, that's another thing that would happen with a lot of veterans that I came across. You know, they would be like, this is fucking BS, man. Like, this is, just, I thought I was just getting some training before I really started college. And it's like, yeah, I mean, in a way it is. It is a way to get your feet wet and train, but, you know, they don't care. You yeah. Know, the, system does, the system sees it as a class. It is a class. You got a professor. You got to be there. You got to pass it. And so you just, you just knocked out four months of your 36 months. Congratulations. Yeah. And I'm going to piggyback off that. Um, it, that, that's a very good point. And the thing is, because I transferred colleges, and 
the way that colleges and universities work is very interesting. Like, if you start at one college and you take, say, I took uh, developmental psychology and then I transferred to another college and they had something similar to it, but it's not under the same course code, that essentially that course that I took before, you can you can try to get it fit in, but if they don't want to fit it in, it's useless. I mean, you took that for no reason you yeah, to your yeah. new degree. Yeah, and what's really shitty about that is that that leads to so many shitty things because um, they one of the one of the, the best course the best course of um, or the best outcome that can happen is they'll 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 find a way to fit it in, but because it was such a challenge to fit it in and, and it, it didn't meet certain codes or whatever. Yeah. Um, it will lower your GPA. So, for example, if, if you're at a city college or from one college to another and you have a 4.0 and they really struggled kind of transferring you in for based off the stuff we're talking about, it, you're, you may transfer in with from a 4.0 to a 3.8 to a 3.6 or shit, you might even fall below um, uh, a bare minimum GPA and suddenly they're going to say, actually, now because of this, you're not even qualified. So it, it's just all these different things and... and um, you know, good, again, good VSO, good peers, people. You know, t- you know, you having a, a, a bet- student veteran network will actually help you and say, hey, don't take that class. Yeah. Whatever you do, do not take that class. It's a great class, but why don't you hold off until you get to your your, your university? Because you do have some leeway to taking some electives that you may just. I mean, there were some guys that were taking um, like a welding class for an elective because they were like, dude, I just need to get my hands on something, and and. Uh, um, will it really impact my career or really matter anything? No, but I I thought it was a really good idea for them. The challenge is that uh, it won't transfer to a university and you have to meet a certain amount of units accomplished in order to qualify for university. And then even if you do, they may not account for that class. And if you got an A in that class and it's equal, it equals to your 4.0 and they don't account for it. Now you're transferring in with a 3.6. And it's some of the, some people just really care about that stuff. I certainly did. And so I chose not to go take those classes because I knew as fun as they would be and beneficial for my mental health or just my well-being, they were going to lower my GPA. And all that stuff matters. If you need to get a master's one day, you need to go do some extra uh, college work, they're going to look at all of that. And if, you, if, 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 they're, if you're looking to go to Harvard, for example, for a master's and they see that you, know, you graduated or at some point had a 3.6, they're not going to care why. Yeah. Maybe they will because of your personal statement, but for the most part, you can't go in with excuses. You have to go in with reasons why you excelled the entire way. Right. Yeah, the GPA matters, especially for higher education. And, and, and the needs of what the civilian world demands now, it, it shifts to the right. I mean, pretty soon, bachelor's degrees are going to mean nothing. Associate's degrees almost do mean nothing as is. Yep, yep. And it just continues shifting to the right. Pretty soon, we'll be living at mom and dad's house till we're 35, you know, before we have a career. And well, uh, by the time. Mom and dad with a master's degree and with and, and barely trying to find entry level jobs, which is a problem. Yeah. Yeah. We all know that. I mean, I can't tell you how many times and this is a problem for not just veterans. I mean, a lot of us start applying for jobs when we're getting closer to graduating and you'll see entry level job with five years of experience. That's not entry level. I mean, five years gives you uh, some expertise and experience. Yeah. And so the, the this is a whole other topic. The American economy is is a whole nother or the american employment and or economy is a whole nother bag of issues um and if and you have to do whatever you can to be as competitive as possible as possible and being a veteran certainly gives you a competitive advantage but it won't if you have a if you have a 3.0 and you're a veteran you've kind of leveled out but yeah. if you're a veteran you have a 3.6 or 3.7 and above you've given yourself a lot of advantages yeah and and you know i learned whenever I, I had to shoot for high grades because I was applying to physical therapy school. I put in one application, and uh, it got denied. And I had a 4.0. Um, I had about 100 hours of observation, and I had all these essays written and everything. They wanted so much stuff. It's ridiculous. And when I talked to you know, a therapist, I was like, hey, do you think 100 is enough? Because you know, their bare minimum was like 80. And she was like, Really? If I were you, I would try to get like 300, and some people even have like thousands. And I'm like, dude, I'm not getting paid to observe, you know? Like, you don't get paid for that. And it's just absurd. Like, that'll continue shifting to the right. And uh, it, it just, 
the demands go up and up and and it's kind of a broken system college is a broken system as well and i think that's a really good point because it's not a placement program so for example if you go to rasp and you graduate you're going to go to ranger regiment right it it, it isn't a guarantee getting a degree is not just going to give you a job and maybe that's common sense to some but it, even though it was common sense to me, I remember filling out, you know, maybe 50 or so applications in the process of my final and last semester of my senior year and not hearing anything back or being rejected and thinking, what was all this for? Right. You know, I did this for a job and a career. I went through, I, I, I was taking six classes a semester, but I graduated in three years, had a great GPA, had a good record, had done everything you everything asked of me. And I still wasn't somehow qualified. Well, can you imagine going to RASP, graduating, and be like, you know what, never mind. I'm not going to take you. Like, what was that all that for? You know what I mean? So that's that's one of those big things where, you know, I've you know some of the buddies that I that get out there, like, I tell them that, and they're like, I'm not going to college, man. I'm not going to go to college with the with the with a high percentage that I'm not going to get a job. Well, okay. That that the reality is that if you're really interested in making some money in our American employment or economy sector the more you have in education the likely the likelihood you're going to make more money and, and that's a decision you're going to have to make and it's unfortunate but but it, but it is the truth right some of the most successful people when it comes to money if that's your thing they're really aggressive with like i'm gonna get my bachelor's and i'm gonna get my master's and then i'm gonna get my phd or edd it's like there's no fun in that but they're really interested in making some serious cash yeah so it's something to think about yeah it's a long road yeah, unless you're self-made, I mean, you're you're looking at years of education if you really want to make any sort of money. Uh, you do have things like trade school, and you might consider trade school uh, depending on kind of what where you see yourself because there are good careers from trade school that pay well. But, you know, if you're looking at a lot of jobs out there in the world, you need a college degree. You need a piece of paper. And that they just continue wanting more on that piece of paper. It's almost absurd. But, you know, we were talking about the GI Bill earlier. Uh, something else that's important to note. I think the difference between, you can correct me if I'm wrong on this. I had the post 9 11, but the difference between the Montgomery and the post 9 11 is the Montgomery, they would give you a lump sum and then you would have to pay your own tuition. And I think with that came more freedom. With. The but but the trade off is you get less benefits with the post nine eleven you get far more money if you're full time, but also with the post nine eleven, uh, you had they are very strict about what classes you can take. It has to be on your degree plan. You can get things subbed in, but it involves going to an advisor, getting it approved, um, and then also if you fail your class or you know, you drop out of a semester or anything like that, you're paying the VA back. And, yep. and so that, you know, you can talk more on that too, Chris. And, and then we also talked about other programs to help pay for college, like uh, the Pell Grant, the Yellow Ribbon Program, things like that is also very important. I don't see a lot of veterans utilizing the Pell Grant. And I used to get paid, uh, got 3300 a semester for the Pell Grant. So you guys listening, you need to look into the Pell Grant and apply for that every uh for every semester that you're going to school get that pell grant and there's also other programs and i'll let chris take it away here yeah that's actually i actually kind of forgot about the pell grant i don't remember how i came across it um i may have someone may have educated me on it and it's essentially free money um i think you have to you obviously have to qualify i think you have to fall below a certain income level and to be honest most veterans do because you're not in college (laughs) with a career you're in college to earn yourself a career and so your income is relatively low um and i don't think they account for um your bah income you may be i, I i'm kind of forgetting some of this stuff now but no, um, no basically it's oh it's so it's a government program uh, that essentially gives money to students any type of student um extra cash to kind of survive yeah. and it's there for you it does you're not disqualified because you're a veteran and it may sometimes a lot of people think that they're like oh not for me because i'm a veteran and I'm not one of those students. Like, no, you actually are, and, and whether you are or not, like, it's it's for all of us. And so, yes, it is. You, I think I think they disperse it per semester, um, and I think yep. it also varies a little bit how much you get depending on maybe where you live. I'm not quite sure, but regardless, it's it's your money. Take it, apply for it. Um, 
the other thing um, that I think I think that uh, is important to know about, and I, I may have forgot something that you wanted me to address on, but let me know, is the Yellow Ribbon Program. So as we mentioned, the, 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 the timeline for your, your GI Bill benefits um, is 36 months, right? Um, and again, if you decide to take a semester off, I don't want people to think like, oh, your, your, your clock is still ticking. No, no, no. It's only in it's only in use while you're in college, but like I said, you you know, well, college is generally speaking four years. Thirty six months is only equal to three years, and so you obviously have to take in more classes, go through summer semesters, and even go to winter semesters, which are about two weeks of crammed in uh, coursework. And I think in, in starting like on January fifth and, and, and like January twentieth, so it's about two weeks. And uh, I did that too, um, but if you don't have the ability to take those kind of supplemental summer and winter quarters or, or semesters, you're, you're, on, you're only going to stick to the two core semesters or quarters through the year, which is spring and fall. You're not going to, 36 months is going to expire if, by the time you get your senior year. And so thankfully, um, a lot of universities and with government uh, kind of cooperation, they've developed this program called Yellow Ribbon Program. If you, it sounds familiar because Yellow Ribbon is a really – you know, military supportive kind of term uh, for a variety of different things. Uh, but basically, if you're in a situation where you're either you don't have any more time left on your GI Bill or you're going to likely run out within the second half of your final year or something like that, they'll cover that gap. Now, every state has a cap. And what I mean is that when I, when I transferred to my university, for an academic year, it was twenty-two. I want no. It was forty thousand dollars for anybody, and act so twenty-two thousand dollars for one semester, and then another twenty or so thousand dollars for the following semester. Yeah. Now, what what the the way the yellow ribbon program works is that they'll give you the needed money based off of the 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 most expensive public institution higher education college in your state. So for California, it's UC Berkeley. It cost about it cost half of the university I went to, so they gave me twenty two thousand dollars to apply to my final year. That meant I still was on the on the hook for a remaining twenty or so thousand dollars, and so ultimately I had to take a loan out. But that was only because I transferred into a private university that really fit the needs that I wanted, and I was and at the end of it, this university is really expensive, and people walk out with hundreds of thousands of dollars. I, I ultimately I put I walked out with ten thousand dollars because I. I had twenty two thousand dollars that I owed, and I put down about twelve or something like that, and so I, I chopped it down a little bit. And so I took out a ten thousand dollar remaining loan that I'm still in the process of paying off. But my point is, if you, you don't go to such an expensive university and you're just at a state institution, you're likely going to get your entire remaining portion that you're short of from your GI Bill paid for through that Yellow Room program. Yeah. And the best part about it is that your BAH comes with it. It's not like if you don't have your GI Bill anymore and you're now using the, the Yellow Ribbon program, your BAH is not accounted for. It actually is, and that was that's a, I mean that's your income, right? So I, I don't know how they well, whoever passed that legislation to include BAH, God bless them, because I mean I, I I assumed going into the Yellow Ribbon program that that it was I was thankful that they were even going to give me something. I didn't expect BAH, and when the college advisors told me, because I'm going to be honest. Actually, my university didn't have a VSO. It was just college adv- advising, and I've I've actually heard that they have a VSO now. Um, you know, I, that's something I certainly uh, pushed for them to do. But you know, I, I, there's only so much I can do. I don't think it. I don't think they got. I don't think they did it because of me. But um, you know, they, they were the ones that actually informed me. Like, no, no, no. Uh, you're going to get your BH. Don't don't worry about that. You're you know, we're, you're going to get your tuition covered for at least half of it for what is remaining. And you're going to get your BH, and that was a really that was a you know for me to you know I graduated that that last year with you know I had two semesters to take and I had a 4.0 each one, and I don't think I would have had that 4.0 if it wasn't for 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 me knowing that I had something to kind of support me along the way. So you, you so my suggestion is if you do a lot of us will do the math right and we'll say like look I don't think I'm going to have enough benefits in my GI Bill to cover me my my all four years or whatever. Um, start looking if you're going to transfer into a university or you're already at a university. Start looking at the, at the yellow room program uh, because you you want to apply for that stuff ahead of time and start kind of calculating all that into your timeline.
Yep. Yeah, that's a good point. And and another point I want to make about the Pell Grant too, because I had a buddy who said, yeah, I'm using the Pell Grant, but he was getting uh, probably a third of what he should have, because what happens is you use your tax return. Uh, that's right. From the previous, right. from I think previous, I think even two years ago, can't remember how it works, but. Um, so he was using his tax return from the time he was in the military. So they were, reco- were recording this big income that he wasn't making anymore. And then he was getting a small chunk of the Pell Grant and uh, less than a third, actually. It was a very small amount. And uh, what you have to do is you have to submit a special circumstance. And in my case, I was like, yeah, um, I make, yeah, I made uh, 33000 that year. But uh, now I make Jack Diddley shit, you know. You make about half. You make about fifteen or so. Yeah, no, I made almost zero, you know, like uh, <laughs> yeah. my income totally changed. And you don't report the uh, the income you get from the GI Bill, and that's also very helpful. So you can get a lot of money from the Pell Grant. You can get 100% of the Pell, and people who don't use that, I mean, you can use that on top of your stipend. And, uh, you know, i got a lot of buddies who uh, get referred to me because – uh, they were like, Burnett figured it out. Like, I don't know how he did it, but he figured it out. And, and it's just cause I was proactive. I, I, I got on unemployment as soon as I got out of the military, got on unemployment. Sadly, that only lasted three weeks. I kind of wish I would have just rode that out, you know, like applied for all the jobs I couldn't get, but I got, I got employed pretty quick cause veterans are a, a hot commodity for all the reasons we talked about previously. Um, but I got hired on pretty quick. That only lasted about seven months cause it was, uh, Mattress sales that made me a store manager. I was working 50 hour weeks. It just was not feasible with college. It didn't make sense and it wasn't a good corporate environment. And that's neither here nor there. But uh, also, I used I used all those other benefits on top of it. So, you know, I, I, uh, my dog peeked in the room. <laughs> what are you doing, buddy? Anyway, I used, uh, I used the uh, Pell and then, you know, I had my GI Bill coming in and I just stayed proactive. Yeah, there's there's even other. I, I know that there's other grants out there. Um, like for example, some um, universities um, allow you. Like let's say you're majoring in government or po- political science, and your state legislature has a grant for those veterans that are studying government um, to apply for to kind of. It's a way of supporting them to kind of stick with it, and so they'll give you extra cash because they know you know your state legislation legislature really knows the struggles they probably know it better than anybody else aside from us and so they, they, they they'll develop um, kind of niche uh, grants just to meet your academic program needs so there's some I remember some for political science uh, there are some for uh, almost you know if you're studying mathematics uh, the university themselves will have a grant for veterans that are studying mathematics um, and that are fall below a certain income level and you got to take yes, you got to write a personal statement on that and really sure. make a compelling statement. But we have that compelling statement, right? Yes, we, we have do. a bunch of compelling reasons why uh, we could qualify for this grant. They have a fixed amount, but you're probably going to be. I don't think I met any veteran that didn't, um, at least at the undergraduate level, didn't did not receive a special grant aside from Pell Grant, a, a special grant of some sorts. Yeah, and I think they're really there to support us. It's, it's minimal time for a lot of money. I mean, if you think about it, you know, you spend maybe 30 minutes writing this letter or maybe even it's longer, but to, uh, to get paid out like, like they do. And it's free money. That's, that's, uh, you don't pay that back. It's not like a loan. So grants, I mean, they give you that money and it's yours. They give you that money and it's yours and that's it. Not, it's not taxable. Um, you don't know, owe anything at the end of the tax year. They just give you that money. And that's your money. And if you're not taking advantage of that, you know, you know you, you're going to need that money. <laughs> you know, you're going to need it. So the way I kind of balance the checkbook is I would kind of put that grant money away. And that would be money I used to pay the bills when I wasn't, when I was in a low moment in between semesters. Because you still have your bills, right? And that kind of is a good segue to BAH process, right? So, but anyways, I would use that money to pay for that month of worth of bills when I was in between semesters, uh, because you're not, so because of the way the BAH wor- uh, system works is if you're, let's say, um, well, let, you're going to get paid the majority of the months, but unfortunately you're going to get prorated. So for example, I got out of the military basically January 5th, uh, 2013. Well, that I enrolled immediately into that upcoming semester, which was spring semester. And it started, I think January 22nd. 
you're going to get paid that month, the month after for the amount of time in school you did. So on February 1st, you get paid for what you did in January. On March 1st, you get paid up for what you did in February, right? So it's just like pay. And um, if you started school on January 22nd, and then on February 1st, you're only going to get paid for the 22nd through the 30th or whatever that month has for amount of days. Yeah, they pay by that day. Your full pay, right? Yes. So um, you're never really, you know, I think I did the math at some point where you you really only get a full paycheck of BAH uh, like about four times out of the year. That's right in the middle of each course semester in your spring and in the fall because in summer you are always starting and ending in the middle of the month. And so when you get paid that following month, you're going to get paid either between the 1st and the 15th or you're going to get paid between the 15th and the 30th. And so when you sign up for these Pell Grants and all these other scholarships, we haven't even talked about scholarships yet, um, you're going to need that money to cover down on the shortage of money that you're not going to get from the BAH, which is your income. Right. So uh, Pell Grants are... uh, yeah, they, they were a big deal for me. And I can't tell you how many personal statements I wrote, but it was worth it every single time. Yes, it was. And so we've spent a long time talking about college, and uh, and it's very important because that's a lot of veterans' plans is to go to school and get an education, and, and that's great because, like we covered, uh, most of the time you need that education. But, you know, there's also other things to consider in the workforce, and I'll kind of let you take that away. Yeah, so um, this is something you and I talked about when we got to know each other. You know, long story short, um, I ended up getting involved in tech, um, being up here, and uh, I eventually transferred up to um, a university I never expected to, but it's called the University of San Francisco. Um, we also have San Francisco State up here, but I transferred to the private university um, just because they fit my needs a little bit better. Um, and there's a big tech kind of career pipeline up here in the Bay Area because we're so close to Silicon Valley. And it took me some time, but, you know, I'm about three years out of college now, and I got recruited for software development, um, um, a more deep... I was already involved in some software development um, where I was at, but um, I was looking to take the next step, so I was, I was getting some personal training um, for software development management. Um, I'm not an actual software developer. I'm not an engineer. But what a lot of veterans don't know, actually, is that there is a lot of management on top of engineers, and a lot of these managers do not have technical backgrounds. Uh, the whole the whole reason is because sometimes engineers are really impressed with what they can do, but it doesn't actually deliver value. Um, so the business needs people right in the middle that are good managers, really disciplined, and to kind of corral the troops, which are engineers, to deliver something as they, as it's been requested. Um, and so just this week alone, so I worked for Walmart Labs, which is essentially the direct competitor to um, Amazon, and I work here in Silicon Valley. Um, and we compete every day with delivering software from a digital perspective um, online with Amazon. And, you know, one day they'll release, you know, a cool feature or product, and the next day we bounce back, and then sometimes we release something, and they bounce back the next time kind of copying us, and it's just kind of the nature of the business. But just this week alone, uh, somehow, some way, I was grouped in into uh, like a community email, and it talked about this veterans program. And, and I'm going to be honest, I don't know a lot of veterans where I work. I think I'm literally the only one in my division. And um, no, I know I am the only one. And I, I, I couldn't help but wonder, what, what are they talking about? Um, are they looking to kind of give back to veterans? So I just, I looked in further, and there, and it, I wasn't, I realized it wasn't really directed to me. I, I got CC'd or included onto the email by, by accident. And, and I learned that there is a hiring program for Walmart, um, whether you're on the technical side, which is what we call technical, uh, Walmart Labs, or just generally Walmart as a whole, to kind of transition yourself out of the military um, and land a job with them immediately. Now, they won't go with you. They won't, they won't, pre- they won't um, present themselves um, while you're separating, I think they should. I actually think when you're an ACAP, they should start inviting these companies to kind of start getting you on their list, um, but they don't. Um, and well, Amazon has this program. They're probably leading the way with their big, they have the biggest veterans transitional program out there in the, in, in, in the employment sector. A bunch of these, t- Google has one, Facebook has one, obviously Walmart Labs has one. Um, and um, what they do is they essentially try to get you to match your skill sets 
um, to a job environment that they have, and they're 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 willing to kind of make it work. So for those of us that were combat arms, there's just not a lot that's going to transition into the business world or technical world. Um, but they'll try to make it happen. For right. example, I'm a technical program manager, and my job is essentially to get an assignment, which is a project, and 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 find the teams that can deliver this, kind of put them together, manage them, and ultimately deliver as expected on that project. Veterans would be are generally really good at you know kind of managing people, communicating the expectations, making sure people stay motivated. And I generally, I mean, I'm still got a big learning curve to go because I still have to. They're still expecting me to learn the the technical side of things as a non-engineer. But they've really seen that I've motivated quite a bit of our peers in a way that they haven't seen before. And I basically tell them, look, it's just my nature as a veteran and, and the way I was raised in the military. So these are things you might want to look into while you're separating or already in college. Look up, look up any big company. Start with a Google search and say, for example, Amazon, and then type in veteran transition. But you can use any any company. It doesn't have to be tech. I just happen to be in tech, and they probably have something, and they'll have a specific point of contact and do that. I mean, that is a guaranteed way to get yourself a job, whether you're in college or you're not in college and are not interested in college but want to get a job right away. Um, so that's I didn't know about these things when I was at the VSO. I certainly didn't know about them when I was separating and going through the ACAP process, and I've only recently learned about them um, within this week, specifically with my company. I knew about it with other companies about two years ago once I was already out, but I was already in my career. Um, and, and then I just found out this, this week alone that our, my own company has that. I've started communicating with them and asked, how can I help? Um, is there some, you know, I've immediately thought, you know what, you guys should be going to the, the, the separating centers for the, the ACAP processes and all that and, and really getting your name out there because, because they're looking to really compete with Amazon and, and be Walmart is America's company. There's no doubt. But the fact that they're not embedded into the army or military separation process, I think is a, a lost opportunity on their part. And that's something that I'm going to try to work with them on that. So I'm also, if you guys ever want to get, get a hold of me, um, you could reach out to Dan and he can probably give you my, uh, my personal information. I'm not going to blast my personal information on, on, on the net or online here, but um, if you're the kind of person that I, that I could help, I, I'd like to help for sure. Yeah, a bunch of, bunch of good points, and I'd be more than willing to do that. You know, you can reach out to me. I'll, I'll turn you over to Chris. He, uh, You know, when we talk, Chris, I, I expected to talk to you for like half an hour, and we ended up talking for like, I think it was like two hours. Um, Chris is somebody yeah, who has a, a lot to talk about. Yes, yeah, there absolutely is. And um, Chris is Chris has a lot a wealth of knowledge for people who are looking to make the transition. He worked on the college side. He's experienced the workforce side. And so, you know, the big takeaway from all of this is you guys have options. You know, I don't want you to get out and because it, you certainly will have hurdles. Um, you know, you're going to have hurdles with the new environment. You're going to have to basically remap some of your brain. It's important to hang on to that old identity. You know, it's part of the reason I'm doing what I'm doing, you know, train like a ranger because I will always and forever be a ranger. Chris will always and forever be a soldier. And uh, that's all at heart. And you transfer that those skills to to lead other people by, you know, whatever means you can out there in the civilian world. And and you're so valuable for for that reason and recognizing that holding on to your prior experiences, you don't have to let go. You can use it as that motor to propel you forever. And uh, and really, my closing statements is, uh, and I'll give Chris a chance to uh, to say his closing statements. But my closing statements is, you guys absolutely have so many options. You know, I would jump for joy to see any of you on my team in my workforce. Um, you guys are so valuable, and it's important for you to know that you have options, and there's resources, of an abundant amount of resources out there for you. And yeah, I think, that, I think that's a good point. Uh, sorry, you cut out a little bit, Dan. I didn't mean to interrupt you. But, yeah, um, no, we were stepping on each other, a little lag, but um, yeah, I'll just give you a chance to, to close. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll just second you. Um, there's a look. There's a lot of options. A lot of resources, but you're going to have to put in the work 
I'm always going to circle back whenever I advise another veteran that I know about their thoughts on getting out or their decision to already get out. You know, I'll tell them those things, you know, these resources, I've had this conversation with them basically with each one and I'll tell them, however, this is for you to go get. It's not going to be presented to you. It's not your entitlement, though it should be. Uh, It's not an easy uh, pipeline in any kind of way. And you're going to have to put in the work. You know, one of the things I say is it, it's not going to be, you know, the kind of work you're going to have to do if you go on a 12-mile rug march. It's not that. And if you think that just because you're a solid soldier uh, that crushes PT and loves getting engaged with the enemy, that you're going to come out here and, and suddenly, uh, you know, do really well in the civilian world, that's just not the case. Right. It, it, it will be eventually because you're going to apply all these things that Dan will talk to you about, which is don't lose your mindset, continue to train like a ranger, continue to be disciplined, but you're going to have to just do a different kind of due diligence here and, and don't let it scare you off. Um, be flexible, be understanding to your environments or be aware of your, your, under, your, your environments and, and continue to put one foot in front of the other. At the end of the day, it's just another process. It's another trek. It's another suck. Um, and you can do it. There's just no doubt about it. It's just if you really want to, and if you're willing to get your ass kicked a little bit by the civilian world for a short period of time in college, it'll pay off um, if you want it to. But that's all I got to say. Again, I'd be happy to advise anybody else on a, on a personal level. Um, and um, I'm always looking to expand my veteran network. There's just not, a, if there's anybody out there listening to this in the Bay Area, there's not enough of. Because I don't know enough veterans in the Bay Area, to be honest, particularly like-minded infantry, infantry types. And so if, even if we just go get a drink or so and just shoot the shit, trust me, I'd love to do that. Yeah, yeah, likewise. And, and uh, you know, you guys will succeed because we, we come from the U.S. military where we learn to adapt. And so that's what you'll have to do if you transition. And if you allow yourself to adapt, you'll be super success, successful. And and Chris, I want to thank you for coming on and, and sharing your time with me. It's been it's been a great conversation. I think this is going to help a lot of people. No, I, I also want to thank you for having me on. This is something that I'm really passionate about. Um, I've seen the VSO. I saw a lot of guys just burn, right? A lot of guys just burn and you know crash and burn and 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 kind of give up on their dreams. And uh, I hate seeing that. And I know it's still happening today. And God, we didn't even talk about the suicide component to, to veterans. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't really, that's a whole other thing. And so I just don't, I hate hearing about that. It's really unfortunate. And uh, I'd like to see more veterans uh, in, the, in, the, in the business world that I work out there as well. Yeah, it's such a hot topic. And, you know, maybe I can have you on again in the future because that's, that's definitely a loaded topic and it deserves its own uh, podcast. Yeah, it certainly does. Yep. So for you guys listening, if you've listened this long, you're awesome. I hope you have a great day. Take care.